going to be in uh, verse 15 starting tonight in chapter 9. Uh, the way we typically start these classes is I remind us where we've been and then we kind of get into the, the meat and potatoes of things. And the interesting thing about chapter 9, uh, Lord willing, we'll end chapter 9 tonight and then move into chapter 10. Chapter 10 really is the accumulation of the letter. It's the climax of the letter, and I'm excited to get to chapter 10. It really points to the so what of, uh, of this document. You know, I've, I've mentioned to you several times, and hopefully it's well known among us now, that the book of Hebrews is a sermon. It is a sermon. And uh, I have to remind myself of this as a preacher. I think all preachers have to remind ourselves of this. And that is, if your audience leaves thinking, so what, you have not done your job as a preacher. Now, your audience can leave thinking, wait a minute, or thinking, I didn't really understand that the way that I need to. That's okay. That's opportunity for deeper study. But what we don't want is for people to leave saying, so what? And typically in a sermon, you spend about 25 minutes out of a 30-minute sermon giving the what, and then about the last five minutes giving the so what. Well, that is exactly how the book of Hebrews lays out. We have spent nine and a half chapters finding the what. Jesus is better than the angels. He is better than Moses. He is better than the law of Moses. He is better than the priesthood. He is better than any sacrifice. And explaining exactly why that is and how Jesus fits into the, the realm of this pattern that came from the Old Testament. So ultimately what we've looked at to this point in the book of Hebrews is the vertical relationship between what Christ did and God the Father. So you have Christ as the high priest of the order of Melchizedek explaining how he can fulfill the role of high priest even though he's not a Levite. Uh, and also that his role and function as the high priest was once for all. It, he doesn't do it uh, every year continually. It's done once for all. And uh, that once for all happened as well in the sacrifice. And the sacrifice is then given to God so that sin could not just be covered but be completely removed. Uh, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. We'll see that here in chapter 10, uh, probably tonight, I believe. Uh, but, and, and, uh, well, also the end of chapter 9 as well. So, we've dealt with the what. What did Jesus do? Why is it important? And how does that fit in with his relationship with God? When we get to chapter 10, we're going to pivot, and instead of seeing the vertical relationship between what Jesus did and God the Father, we're going to see the horizontal relationship between what Jesus did and what that means for us. So again, the point of a sermon is to tell your audience, so what? We can look at the book of Hebrews and we can talk theology all day long. Uh, we can look at the, the intricate parts of the Old Testament being fulfilled in Jesus. And all of that's well and good. We've done that to this point and we'll continue to do that. But at the end of the day, the so what is Christ's offering of himself matters for you. It is the most fundamentally important thing to happen for you. And for you means for them and for us as well. Okay, so let's begin here in uh, chapter 9, verse 15 through 21. And it says, And so he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the, the eternal inheritance he has promised, since he died to set them free from the violations committed under the first covenant. For where there is a will, the death of the one who made it must be proven. For a will takes effect only at death, since it carries no force, while the one who made it is alive. So even the first covenant was inaugurated with blood. For when Moses had spoken every command to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, and said, This is the blood of the covenant that God has commanded you to keep. And both the tabernacle and all the utensils of worship he likewise sprinkled with blood. So here again we have this idea of sacrifice, the idea of a sacrificial blood being the means by which something is cleansed. And so I think there's a difference here because it seems that the author of Hebrews is kind of talking out of both sides of his mouth where he says on the one hand, 
that the blood of bulls and goats can't take away sin. And yet on the other hand, the blood of, of bulls and goats were used to purify and to cleanse. And I, I think the fundamental difference there is that when you think about the, the blood that is spilt in the Old Testament according to the law of Moses, even the Day of Atonement, the sprinkling on the mercy seat, uh, even sprinkling the people, sprinkling the book, sprinkling the utensils in the tabernacle, what you're doing in that instance is you're not necessarily taking sins away, but you're making it possible for God to have sacred space. And these places and these instances are places of sacred space. You see sacred space in Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3 before the fall in the Garden of Eden. You see sacred space in the tabernacle reestablished at the end of Exodus, beginning of Leviticus. God comes and speaks to the people from within the tabernacle. The glory of the Lord fills the tabernacle. God does the same uh, with the temple. And then ultimately in Jesus, we beheld his glory, John chapter 1 and verse 14, the glory of God present on the earth. And with the Christian, we have the presence of God with us. We have the glory of God with us. It's ultimately one day going to be fulfilled in the return of Jesus. So let's start back in verse 15. He is the mediator of a new covenant. I get uh, tickled when people say, well, you have to call Jesus either the mediator or call him the intercessor and Jesus mediates and the Spirit intercedes and this, that, and the other. Friends, we need to be very careful about limiting the role of a member of the Godhead to certain particulars. We need to be very careful about that. We've already seen in the book of Hebrews that Jesus not only mediates the new covenant, but he does intercede on behalf of sinners by going into the heavenly sanctuary, into the holy place, and performing that rite for us on our behalf. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us with prayers uh, uh, too deep for groanings, Romans chapter 8. Uh, so it, we need to be very careful about how we use our terminology and not limit that terminology to just particular members of the Godhead. So he's the mediator of the new covenant. Who is the mediator of the old covenant? Moses, right. So again, we're building on that theme of Jesus, the new Moses, Jesus, the better Moses, so that all who are called may receive eternal inheritance he has promised. Uh, this eternal inheritance is everlasting life, right? It's the, the whosoever believes should not perish but have eternal life, John three sixteen. Uh, it's the gift that only God can give, and it's the gift of grace that comes uh, through Jesus Christ, and it's what he's promised. And it says, since he died to set them free from the violations committed under the first covenant. Jesus says that if you uh, break one part of the covenant, you break all the covenant, right? Paul says that as well in the book of Romans. Uh, so if, if I have broken one aspect of the covenant and kept all the other commands, 613 commands in the law of Moses, if I break one and keep 612, I violated the entire covenant. Right, and, and so people kind of think, and we theologians have been asked this. They're like, "Well, what if you had, what if you had a baby, and you keep that baby in a dungeon, in a dark room with cinder block walls, and you just let that baby live their life? You offer food and, and water and nourishment and all this, and you let that baby live their life, but they never commit a sin. Do they still need Jesus? Well, let's think about that for just a few minutes." If you had to boil the law of Moses down, what could you limit it to? Well, we might limit it to the Ten Commandments. Okay? On, on every, uh, every other law in the law of Moses rests on the Ten Commandments. But the Ten Commandments could be boiled down to two laws, which Jesus does. Right? He says, love God, love your neighbor. I can't speak for the scenario because a scenario is a scenario, but I would imagine that a child who is in that kind of environment might develop some kind of hatred for the person who put them there, right? I also might imagine that a child who lives in that environment would never know who God is. So how can you love God if you don't know who he is? And there's the hatred that might come from that particular environment. So my point with this is that if you violate the law in one area, you've, you violated the entire law, right? And as humans, we have a tendency to not love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength because we build idols for ourselves and the things that make us feel good and the things that we want. And we have a real tendency of not loving our fellow man. This was the problem with the children of Israel that the prophets spoke about. 
They were building idols and worshiping other gods besides Yahweh, that's for sure. But they were also not taking care of the least in their society. They were not taking care of widows. They weren't taking care of orphans. They weren't taking care of the stranger and the sojourner. And it's the same problems they had then that we have today. Well, how can you say that you are keeping the law of Moses when you're not going to take care of the very people that the law of Moses wants you to take care of? So the point then is Jesus died to set them free from violations committed under the first covenant. Every single one of us have broken the covenant if we're being held by that standard, and Jesus died to set us free from that. For where there is a will, the death of one who made it must be proven. The word will here is like last will and testament. Uh, What's the will that Jesus left behind? Jesus left behind the will of eternal life. If, if you have a father or mother, grandfather, grandmother, whatever, who passes away and they leave you a will, that's your inheritance. Well, what does the Bible say here in verse 15 that our inheritance is? It says it's our eternal inheritance. Right? That's the, the, what's left behind in the will, so to speak, by the death of Jesus. And it only takes place at his death. And so you also have to remember that this is, I don't want to make a theological mountain out of this molehill, but at the time of writing of the book of Hebrews or the preaching of the the message of Hebrews, Gnosticism is starting to gain traction and has gained traction. There are several of our uh, books of the New Testament that are written solely for the purpose of combating Gnosticism. And among other things, Gnosticism taught that Jesus didn't really die, that the godness of the man Jesus left before the man actually died, so therefore God never died. Well, the author of Hebrews says the promise that comes through the will, the inheritance that you get through the will, cannot be enacted unless the person has died. So Jesus had to die in order for us to receive the promise that was given. Verse 18, since for even the first covenant was inaugurated with blood. Well, we, we all, because we are New Testament Christians and we understand that the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is what is the most fundamental moment in the history of ever, but also in the history of our lives and our relationship with God, uh, we sometimes neglect the Old Covenant. But the New Covenant was inaugurated with blood. The Old Covenant was inaugurated with blood. We're going through the book of Exodus now on Sunday mornings when I preach and have been for quite some time, and we're starting to get to that point in Exodus where in your yearly Bible reading you quit reading because it has to do with the tabernacle and the law and things like that. And, uh, and it can get really heavy. But what Moses does is he takes the blood that was offered and he sprinkles it on a couple of different things. He sprinkles it on the utensils of the tabernacle. Why? Because the utensils are in the tabernacle and tabernacle sacred space. It has to be fit for sacred space. Okay, he sprinkles blood on the people. Why? Well, the people are sinful and God cannot dwell among sin. So the people have to be purified in order for God to fill sacred space. But the third that, uh, that, Jesus, or that Moses rather sprinkles blood on is rather interesting. He does it on the book of the covenant. The very law of God that God had given Moses. He sprinkles it on the book of the covenant. And the symbolism there is we're inaugurating the covenant through the shedding of blood. It's the same symbolism that we have with Jesus. We're uh, inaugurating the covenant through the shedding of blood. You notice that the tools that were used, weren't. it wasn't just the blood of calves and goats, it was also water and scarlet wool and hyssop. Uh, you can read a hundred commentaries and get a hundred different views on what this symbology of these things are. We have absolutely no idea what hyssop is. Uh, We've never been able to really understand. There are different views, but what the hyssop tree is. Uh, But it is interesting that hyssop is often used in the Old Testament and in the New, but in particular the Old, as a purifying agent. And I don't know why that is. Maybe it was just something designated by God. Maybe there was something purifying about it. But you remember when Jesus was on the cross and he cried out, I thirst the soldier gave him sour wine by putting a sponge on a hyssop branch, right? And so you have the the tools of instituting the covenant even there in the sacrifice of Jesus. You have blood, you have water, you have hyssop, 
and some have made a connection to the linen being the, the garment that was cast for lots. And so all of those, and I know it says scarlet here, that's for you to debate in your own mind, but some have made the connection that even the, the instruments of instigating the covenant were present with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. I find that to be uh, rather interesting myself. And so verse 21, both the tabernacle and utensils of worship, he likewise sprinkled with blood. And so ultimately what Jesus had to do was he had to die for the covenant to be enacted. Any time a covenant was going to be enacted, something or someone had to die in, in, the, in the Bible. So I have two examples up here. The first is Genesis 15 and then the other is Jeremiah 34. Uh, I just want to think about Genesis 15 for a moment. The very, uh, it's not the first covenant. Uh, the first covenant, arguably, is the Adamic covenant, which uh, is between God and Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3 at their fall. What does God do? Uh, they realize that they're naked. They put together a covering that is inappropriate, a covering of fig leaves, and then God gives them animal skins. And uh, I never really noticed this until uh, someone pointed it out to me, and you've probably noticed it well before now, but to have an animal skin means you had to have an animal that was once alive and is now no longer alive. And so it's the shedding of blood. The shedding of blood provides a covering, which is what the ultimately the law of Moses would be, the shedding of blood that provides a covering. In Genesis 15, God institutes a covenant with Abraham. And uh, remember, God calls Abraham in Genesis 12. Abraham goes. He, he doesn't really offer any qualms about going. He just kind of goes. And then after a period of time, several years in fact, by the time we get to chapter 15, uh, Abraham is starting to question God. Hey, I thought this was going to happen. I thought that you were going to give me descendants, and I thought that you were going to give me the child of promise, and that my descendants would be numerous as the stars and the sands on the sea. But this isn't happening, so what's up? And uh, God institutes the covenant with Abraham by taking animals and cutting them in half. God tells Abraham, cut these animals in half. And then the torch passes through the divided bodies of the animals. You remember this. The symbology there, and we have other documents from the ancient Near East that say this, is basically saying, may what happened to these animals happen to me if I break my promise. So the other documents that we have is like, if I want to buy a car from Craig, and we still operate under these systems, Craig, I have to bring you one of Kayla's chickens and kill it, and say, if I don't pay my monthly payment to you, then you can kill me. Okay, that's, what, that's the message that's being presented. Now the question for us maybe is, well, wait a minute, I thought Abraham was a faithful person, so why is it then that uh, God would need to affirm his promise? Well, remember the book of Numbers tells us that Abraham's father, Terah, was an idol worshiper. Jewish tradition, rabbinic tradition, says that he was an idol maker. Now that's tradition. I don't know if it's true or not, but he was at least an idol worshiper. My personal view is that Abraham was also an idol worshiper for 75 years of his life until God called him out of Haran. And if you go back and look at the gods that they worshipped, those gods were tricksters and liars. And if Abraham takes that perspective and applies it to Yahweh then yes, Yahweh, we know that God can't lie, but Abraham doesn't know that, right? And so what God does is he gives Abraham what he needs in the moment. He institutes the covenant by shedding blood, by passing through uh, that blood. So what Christ does then is he takes the curse of death, he takes the curse of the tree upon himself. That leads us then to verse 22 through uh, 28, or verse 22 rather through verse 24. Sorry, forgot to change the top. It says, indeed, according to the law, almost everything was purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. So it was necessary for the sketches of things in heaven to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves required better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with hands, a representation of the true sanctuary, but into heaven itself. And he appears now in God's presence for us. Again, we have seen this multiple times from chapter 7 to now that Christ entered into the heavenly sanctuary, that he entered into the very place where God actually is. And so the question that the preacher is answering is how can he do that, right? It's a question that we've been answering for quite some time. 
that according to the law, almost everything was purified with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. So you have to have the blood sprinkled on the elements. You have to have the blood given on the, the mercy seat. You have to have the blood sprinkled on the people and, and so on and so forth in order to create sacred space. So verse 23 says, It was necessary for the sketches of things in heaven to be purified with these sacrifices. Uh, we're, we're talking here about sketches, right? Not the actual, but the shadow, the sketch of things. Remember Exodus 25, God tells Moses, I want you to create the tabernacle based upon the things you have seen on the mountain, right? Um, rabbinic tradition says Moses saw into heaven. And uh, I'd have to go back and read the chapter, maybe it makes that more clear. But it, the, the tabernacle, the temple, are sketches of the heavenly things. But the heavenly things themselves require a better sacrifice than these. So we're not talking here about the tabernacle or the temple. We're talking about the actual heavenly place, and it's Christ's blood that offers the better sacrifice. Christ did not enter sanctuary made with hands. Of course, we've seen that phrase before. Christ entered into the actual sanctuary, the actual place where God is in the heavenly places, um, into heaven itself, and He appears now in God's presence for us. I think sometimes we limit Christ's role in heaven to where you know you have God on the throne and Christ seated at his right hand and it's kind of like he's sitting there eating off of a cluster of grapes and getting waved by the palm branches as king. But Christ has a purpose and a function in the heavenly places and it's for us. If you're reading this in Greek, the word for here is, an, is a word to denote advantage. It's for our advantage. And so our place is still right in front of us here in the text that Christ goes into God's presence on our behalf for us so that we can maintain fellowship with God. It, it brings to mind that beautiful passage in 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. John writes, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin, but if you sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. That he is the propitiation for our sins. Uh, that, that he is able to go into the place where God is to offer the blood, to offer that, uh, that cleansing element so that we can have fellowship with God. Okay, so uh, what Christ does then is he presents himself as both offerer and offering. Now understand, to a Jewish mind this would have made no sense because the priest never offers himself, right? It's always the, the bull, the goat, the turtle dove, you know, whatever uh, that's being offered there. And so from chapter 7 to now in chapter 9, the preacher has explained how Christ can be both offerer and offering, how he can be both priest and victim and how he's honored and glorified in both of those things and so because Christ willingly offered himself we'll talk about why willingly is so important I believe in the next couple of verses but he willingly and obediently offered himself because he did that sin is taken away by the power of his blood and that means that you and I, as recipients of that blood, can have free and total access to God. I think there is a problem theologically with some of our uh, Christian sects that say you can only approach God on certain days. Like you can only, you can only approach God on Passover or on Easter or on Christmas. Or if, in order to approach God, you have to do it by means of a priest, right? Something like that. Uh, the book of Hebrews totally disagrees with that. If we are in Christ, we have free and total access to God whenever we desire because Christ is there for us. He is in that place for us. So, okay, let's move on then to verse uh, 25. He did not enter to offer himself again and again the way the high priest enters the sanctuary year after year with blood that is not his own. 
for then he would have to suffer again and again since the foundation of the world, but he has appeared once for all in the consummation of the ages to put away sin by his sacrifice. And just as people are appointed to die once and then face the judgment, so also after Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many, to those who eagerly await him he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation. I uh, don't want to say too much necessarily about this particular passage because it's things that we've seen multiple times up to this point. We're bringing the text to an end in this particular chapter, although you all will know that the original document didn't have chapter and verses. Uh, one point that I do want to make, though, is if you're studying with someone, particularly of the Catholic tradition, who believes in the doctrine of transubstantiation, you might want to make a note in your Bible to come to this verse. Uh, the doctrine of transubstantiation says that when you take of communion, the Eucharist as they would call it, uh, Eucharist comes from the Greek word Eucharisto, which means to give thanks. That's what Jesus does when he institutes the Lord's Supper. He gives thanks. And they believe that the bread and the cup turn into the literal body and blood of Jesus as you eat. And I can sympathize with this view for a couple of reasons. First of all, the text says in the Lord's Supper and Institution passages, take this is my body, take this is my blood. And a very literal reading of that would give us a very literal interpretation, but I'm not so sure that we are to read it literally because Jesus also says, I'm not going to eat or drink of this until I do it in my kingdom with you. Does that mean that Jesus is going to eat and drink his own body and, and blood? I don't think so. Uh, but secondly, I do think that there is something that we can learn from that. Uh, in particular, when we take of communion, it is not an individualistic thing. So but there's been debate in the Lord's church since COVID. When are we going to start passing the plate again? You know, I really like that we don't pass the plate anymore. And I'll tell you why. Because when we pass the plate, the people here eat and drink and the people back there eat and drink, and we all do it at different times as an individualistic thing, self-reflective. When we have the communion kits, we're doing it all together, and communion is a collective thing. And when we do it, we're not just communing with one another, we are communing with Christ in His kingdom. The kingdom is here. It's in present tense in the New Testament after the resurrection of Jesus. Now, Transubstantiation then, I think, goes too far in suggesting that the emblems actually become the literal thing. And the reason that I have trouble with that, uh, aside from the miraculous part of it, but I have trouble with that because if you take that doctrine, and the doctrine of the Catholic Church is this, that Jesus dies every time you take the Eucharist. What does the text say? It says he died once for all, right? He has appeared once for all at the consummation of ages to put away sin by his sacrifice. Just as people are appointed to die once and then to face judgment, so also after Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many, to those who eagerly await him, he will appear a second time. So Christ died once. There is nothing that, that, that should cause us to believe that Christ dies over and over and over and over and over again especially every time we take of the Lord's Supper. What we're doing is we're communing with one another, we're communing with the church worldwide, and we're communing with Jesus in the kingdom. Now, uh, that's one false doctrine to address. The second is uh, what the word many here means in verse 28. Uh, what does it mean for him to bear the sins of many? So a Calvinist would read this and say, well, see there, Jesus didn't die for the sins of the whole world. He died for the many, that being those who were predestined to be saved since the foundation of the world. And they'll go to passages like Romans 5 and, and 6 and 7, and they'll go to passages like Ephesians chapter 1 to argue for the predestination uh, point. And uh, it is certainly true that God has predestined. The, the Ephesians 1 is clear about that. God has predestined. The question is, who or what has God predestined? And nowhere in the New Testament does it say that God has predestined individuals. God predestined the church. The church was going to come whether we wanted it or not. God has predestined the church. And then we can choose to be in it or not. 
So you can choose to be chosen. That's a good way of thinking about it. So what does it mean here that he uh, bore the sins of many? Does that limit the atonement that Jesus has given? Uh, no, it doesn't. And a really good way to think about this, this is not uh, original to me, um, but a really good way to think about this is to think about how the Greek language uses the word many. Um, the Greek language uses the word many to oftentimes talk about all or whoever is included in this particular context. So imagine, if you will, that uh, I haven't had this in a long time and now that I'm saying it, I really want some. Imagine that I had a big bag of Skittles up here on this table. And let's say that I ate all the Skittles. Did I have many Skittles? Sure I did. I had as many as were there. If I ate two or three, that would be few. Well, the Greek language does the same thing with the word many. Just because you say many, that does not necessarily mean that there's a certain limit. But what it does mean is that Jesus bore the sins of those who would be included in the number of whom he bore the sins of. I know that's a really roundabout way of thinking about it. Uh, but it's obvious that not everyone is going to be a member of the body of Christ. Right? But for those of us who are, Jesus bore our sins. And the offering is there for those uh, for whosoever will. And so he is going to appear a second time. Uh, I get tickled a little bit because sometimes at funerals people will quote verse 27 and they'll say that people are appointed to die once and then face the judgment. And that echoes Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 13 and 14 that uh, at the end of the matter is this, fear God, keep his commandments, that we're all going to die and then face the judgment, right? So that's, that's obviously biblical. We're all going to die, we're all going to face judgment. But that's not the point of the text. The point of the text is just as it is true that every single human will draw a last breath and stand before God, it's an accepted fact. Just as that is true, Christ is going to return and when he does, he'll return a second time not to bear sin but to bring salvation. You say, wait a minute, I thought salvation was already brought. Well, this is uh, difficult to put into words, but it's theologically true. When we come to Christ, we are saved. When we come out of the waters of baptism, the blood of Jesus takes away our sins. Uh, as Ananias told Paul in Acts twenty two sixteen. 16, our sins are washed away, right? They are removed from us. And, uh, and so we have then salvation in its fullness. But then we are being saved. We have salvation, we are then being saved because Christians still sin, right? 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, If you walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from sin. The cleanses there is present tense. It doesn't mean a once saved, always saved, continual cleansing of sin, but what it does mean is that while we walk in the light, even when we trip, there is grace that is given by the blood of Jesus. So we are saved, we are being saved, and then when Christ returns, we will be saved. Right? We will be saved in the same way that Noah and his family were saved from the evil generation that they were part of. I sure hope that this is not all salvation has to offer. Because if it is, have y'all seen this world? I mean, I'm looking forward to the ultimate fulfillment of salvation where I have fellowship with Jesus Christ and with God the Father completely unveiled by the veil of sin. And I think you're looking forward to that too. So there is a we are saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. And this is what that points to. When Jesus comes back, he's not coming back to die on the cross. He's not coming back to bear sin. He's coming back to bring salvation. And that ends chapter uh, 9 for us. That gives us just enough time to be dangerous with chapter 10. That sounds fun. Okay, chapter 10 and verse 1. Now we're getting to the point where we're focusing more on the horizontal aspect. What does the blood of Jesus, what does the death and sacrifice of Jesus mean for you and me? And ultimately, really in this context, for, for their original audience. 
For the law possesses a shadow of good things to come, but not the reality itself, and is therefore completely unable, by the same sacrifices offered continually year after year, to perfect those who come to worship. For otherwise they would not have ceased to be offered, since the worshipers would have been purified once for all, and so have no further consciousness of sin. Uh, but in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sin year after year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. That famous phrase there in verse 4 it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. So the argument goes like this. The, the old law was inadequate. And we've seen since chapter 7 that the old law was inadequate. Um, and it was inadequate because of the human agents who enacted the law, the human agents who were uh, to uphold the law, failed the law, and had to purify themselves before they could purify others, uh, namely the priest there in that particular instance. Um, uh, verse 2, for otherwise would they not have ceased to be offered since the worshipers have been purified once for all and have no further consciousness of sins. Uh, forgiveness and consciousness here are very closely linked. And, and so remember, your, your consciousness of sin means that you are aware of your sin and you are mindful of your sin and you have, you have to hold on to your sin. It's guilt, right? And this is the beautiful thing of uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21, which we talked about last week. That uh, when you're baptized into Christ, the, the text says, Baptism now saves you, not as a removal of filth from the flesh, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. Right? An appeal to God for guiltlessness. An appeal to God for true forgiveness and the releasing of the things of the sin that we hold on to. That is a problem with Christians today. We can be baptized into Christ and still hold on to the very guilt and shame that we felt. Not that you don't have to deal with the consequences of your sin. That's certainly true. You will have to deal with the consequences of your sin. But there is freedom in Christ Jesus, and we forget that. We forget that. So, verse 3, the sacrifices, uh, those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins year after year. When you Again, a, an allusion back to Leviticus 16, the Day of Atonement, that when you come to the tabernacle, when you come to the temple for the Day of Atonement, the priest has to sanctify himself before he can sanctify the people. Bringing those sacrifices, having the sacrifices offered on your behalf, you would think that that would be a joyous occasion, but the Day of Atonement is not a joyous occasion. It's a reminder of the sin that you've committed that year. And so you come back the next year and you do it again and the next year and you do it again. There is never freedom from the guilt of sin in the law of Moses. There's only the reminder. So to this point, chapters 8 through 10 have demonstrated that the law of Moses is inadequate and Christ's redemptive work then is going to be necessary for our relationship with God as we have seen. And let's see, I think that's enough for that. Let's move on to uh, verses 5 through 10. That would be a good place for us to stop tonight when we get down to verse 10. Uh, so when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offerings you desire, but a body you prepared for me, whole burnt offerings and sin offerings you took no delight in. Then I said, Here I am, I have come. It is written of me in the scroll of the book to do your will, O God. When he says above, Sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor did you delight in them which are offered according to the law. Then he says, Here I am, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first to establish the second. By his will we have been made holy through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. A lot of words to say one main point. And that is, in order for Jesus' sacrifice to be acceptable, there are a couple of caveats that we've not thought about until this very point. Well, he had to be a pure and perfect and holy sacrifice, right? If it's going to be of the type of the Old Testament, he had to at least be pure and holy uh, and, and, and uh, perfect. But he also had to be obedient. Now think about this. In the prophets, particularly the minor prophets, you have people who are coming to the temple, they are worshiping God, but their heart's not in it, right? They're going through the motions, they're offering sacrifices, but their heart is not in it. And so God says, 
I don't want your sacrifices. I reject your sacrifices. What I want is your heart, and I want the sacrifice to be the expression of love. I don't want the, the going through the motions. You know, it's, it's like, gentlemen, if you buy your wife flowers once a month and then go home and beat your wife, the flowers mean nothing, right? The, the flowers mean absolutely nothing. What your wife wants is love and dedication. It's not about the gift. It's about the way in which the gift is given. And so this was a problem for the people of Israel. And God says, I don't want your sacrifices. So the difference between Jesus, the perfect Israel, the perfect son, and Israel, the imperfect son, which is how Israel is depicted in Jeremiah in particular as a, as a prodigal son, is that Jesus was fully obedient in offering a sacrifice. It, it is... It's amazing how the story of the Bible lines up with these minor parts, these minor scenes all throughout the Bible. So, for example, Cain and Abel, right? We're familiar with the story of Cain and Abel. You have Cain who uh, offers a sacrifice because he just has to. He, it seems from the text that he doesn't give his best, he doesn't care, and doesn't want anything to do with it, but he does it out of obligation. And then you have Abel who gives perhaps the best. He gives a blood sacrifice and... and Abel is honored and Cain is not. Abel's sacrifice is accepted and Cain's is, uh, is rejected. With Israel as the older brother, Israel's sin is offering an imperfect sacrifice. No matter how good the sacrifice is, they're not doing it out of devotion to the Lord. And then you have Jesus, the younger brother, the younger son, who offers in obedience and they kill him for it. So, when the, the whole point here is a quotation from Psalm 40, verses 6 through 8. And the point of the quotation is to say, I'm obedient. I'm willing. You're looking for someone. Here I am. So sacrifices and whole burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor did you take delight in them. Why? Because the attitude in which they were offered was an inappropriate attitude. Verse 9, then he says, here I am, I've come to do your will. That's Jesus' prayer in the garden. right? When Jesus is praying in the garden, he prays, not my will, but yours. Right? I'm here to do your will. There's a, an interesting theological question, and I don't really know if I have the answer to it or not. I think I do. But the question is, could Jesus have said no? Well, if he would have said no, he would have been in disobedience to the will of God and would have been in rebellion against God and Jesus as the Christ, as the obedient son, contrary to the disobedient son of Israel, I don't think Jesus could have nor would have said no. You know, we, we sing a song about, you know, they searched through heaven and found a Savior. No, they didn't. There was always a Savior from the foundation of the world. Okay. So when Jesus says, I've come to do your will, it's not my will, but yours be done. He does away with the first to establish the second. By his will, verse 10, we've been made holy through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So once again, we are bringing it back to the so what. And this is a really good place for us to end on. So what? So what of the order of Melchizedek? So what of the, the perfect sacrifice? So what of the priesthood? So what of the sanctuary? So what of all of these things that we have just bought out ibuprofen over the past couple of weeks? So what about all that? Here's the so what. We've been made holy through the offering of Jesus Christ. There's no holiness unless it's in Jesus Christ. His blood, His obedience, His body, if we're in it, we've been made holy.